Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and to our podcast. We are now at Proper 19, and that's Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. And we are today going to look at the parables of the lost sheep and of the lost coin. These are the stories that prepare us for the story of the prodigal son. And again, chapter 15 is beautiful, Luke. It's um, the stories that we see here are found um, in the Gospel of Luke, and they express our Lord's love for the lost. And let's take a look at them now. Um, it happened that they were there uh, drawing near to him. Now, drawing near means coming close, but I think also spiritually, in a sense, drawing near to Christ are... Again, the tax collectors and the sinners. This is a great Lucan theme. He eats and drinks together with tax collectors and sinners. We saw this in the calling of Levi, of, of Matthew. And they drew near um, in a liturgical setting, I suppose, um, to hear preach. But they, they wanted to hear him. So Christ is the source. He is the preacher. And the tax collectors and sinners are coming close to him. Meanwhile... The coming of Christ is for the rising and falling of many in Israel. Those who should be close, who are the Pharisees and the scribes, well, they are grumbling. And they're like the children of Israel in the desert. Uh, they're grumbling against the Lord. So you see a kind of a movement. The tax collectors and sinners are coming close to Jesus and the the Pharisees and the scribes are, by their grumbling, actually moving away from Jesus or setting themselves at odds with Jesus. And they're saying, this man, this one, Jesus, receives sinners. Jesus, sinners, doth receive. We sing that. Um, but this is the Gospel of Luke. He receives them. This is a liturgical term. This is a church term. He receives them. Uh, we say this, we have this kind of language today. We say we receive into membership people. So he receives them, and I love that. Again, he eats with them. And to eat with them, that is a picture of the communal life of the church, of the Lord's Supper, of the meal scenes in Jesus in chapters 5, 7, 11, and 14, that Jesus... When you think about the Lord's Supper in the Gospel of Luke, it's not simply that he feeds us, which he does, but he loves to eat with us. He loves to drink with us. He loves to be with us. In chapter 22, he says, with great desire, I desire to eat with you, eat this Passover. So in the Lord's Supper, you see Christ's desire. He eats with tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus told to them this parable. And this parable, it's different than the Matthew parables where they're, 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 they're one thing means another. Uh, the parables in Luke are often more like stories, the vivid, vivid ways of bringing to us a picture of who God is, who Christ is. So he uses a common kind of a theme. Which man among you? Now by saying that, all of you would. Which man among you, if you had a hundred sheep, and you lost one of them, if you lost one of them, who, which one among you would not leave the 99 in the desert and go and get that which was lost until you find it? Well, um, we can say that Jesus is the good shepherd. We can say that he lays his life down for the sheep. But here the story is not how he's unlike other shepherds, it's how he's just like other shepherds. And what we're getting at here is, um, which one of you, if you had a hundred and you lost one, you'd go out and find that sheep. And I'll see what happens, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, now this is Luke at his best, this is Jesus at his best, and finding it, he places it upon his shoulder, shoulders rejoicing. Uh, I love this picture. It, it could be the picture 
of a father maybe, you know, when you see a father, I remember I have three kids, but when they were little, putting them on the shoulder, putting the sheep on the shoulder, it's one of the favorite pictures in all of stained glass and art. And people love to see this picture of, of Jesus, the tender shepherd, putting that sheep on his shoulders. And then there is this theme of rejoicing. And it's not over. Rejoicing means you can't rejoice by yourself. If you want to rejoice, you need to tell everybody about it. You need to have a party. So he calls together, Sun Kale. He summons together. He calls together his friends and neighbors. This is like a person who has a wedding feast. He's so excited that his daughter's getting wedding, getting married. And he invites everybody there. He invites his friends. He invites his neighbors and he says, Rejoice with me. And that's what rejoicing is all about. You can't rejoice by yourself. You need to be with others. It's not, you know, it's, it's the old saying or fra it's the, the old kind of thought that uh, a steak is fine. You could eat a great steak, but I'd rather eat a hamburger with friends. And rejoicing demands that you get together your friends and your neighbors in order to celebrate. And that's the way the shepherd feels about when he finds, and he says, I have found the sheep that was lost. And, you know, even if you're a friend or neighbor, I don't know if you care that he lost his sheep, but you're happy for him and you're happy to be invited to the party because he's happy. So it's very good. Now, there's another story in verse 7. Oh, just, oh yeah, of course, this is the, the, the end of it here. Sorry. I say to you, just also, there will be joy in heaven. There is joy in heaven. Over the henny, over the one sinner who repents, than over 99 righteous ones. And whether they're righteous or not, you could debate. Um, in one sense, we're all repentant sinners. But in another sense, um, uh, we're, we're talking about the aspect here of how great it is when somebody has fallen away from the faith and comes back. It's natural. Uh, it's, it's like, imagine, you, you know, think about your, yourself if you're a parent and you have three kids and you're happy the two are there with you. This is the prodigal son, was one other son. You, they're with you all the time, but the one that's lost, you think about, you think about, you pray over the one that's lost, and when the one comes back to the house, how much rejoicing there is. And so also in heaven, there's, and this is, gives us an attitude in the church. It gives us an attitude about conversion. It gives us an attitude that when people have gone astray, that how we welcome them with open arms, how we're excited when they come back, that we pray for them, that we think about them, because we want them to be with us. So um, I say to you, there'll be more joy in there's There's uh, joy in heaven, over more joy than over of one person who repents than over 99 righteous ones who have no need of repentance. And that can be used truly, those of us in the church. It can also be used ironically over those who feel they have no need to repent. And of course, we all need to repent. Now the next story is uh, quite, it's short, but it gives us, Luke loves to do this. He tells a story from the male perspective and then he tells it from the female perspective. And the second one is the story of a woman. Some people think this is a story of the church because it's a woman, uh, the bride of Christ. I don't think necessarily so. Our Lord himself is happy to call himself, compare himself to a mother hen. Um, but to give it a different perspective on this, we can think of if we don't want to go the shepherd route, there is a certain woman who has drachma or coins having them 10. She has 10. But if she should lose one drachma, uh, what will she do? Well, um, she'll get out her, she'll get out her lamp, and she does not light the lamp, and the luke's on, and she's gonna sweep the house. You can imagine this, and she seeks tirelessly. She keeps going until she finds it. Um, and then there's the same kind of pattern that we saw with the shepherd. And when she finds it, Eureka moment, Yaruso, she 
calls together. He or she calls again together her friends and her neighbors, and she says, Rejoice with me, for I have found the drachma, the coin, that was lost. Now I tell you, there is joy in heaven. Uh, well, here it's better. I, thus I say to you, there will be joy among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So from the heavenly perspective, the angels are rejoicing when someone returns to the fold. Now there are a couple ways of thinking about this, and this is true of all parables. You can say, look how different God is than us because his great love. I don't think that that's the point here. I think with the shepherd, we'd all go out and seek that one. And if a woman, we'd all go out and seek that, look for that one coin. Well, is either one particularly valuable? Well, I would say objectively no. Because again, a person has a hundred sheep and loses one. Well, you know, that's a problem for the shepherd, but maybe not for me. That's a 1% loss. If I had a friend who had stocks in the stock market and said to me, I lost 1% yesterday, the stocks went down 1%. It might be nice and, you know, I might say, well, okay, sorry to hear that. I might humor him a little bit, but I really wouldn't care that much. Also, the woman, if you wanted to make the story about a great loss, you would say, there was a woman who had one coin and she lost it. Or had two coins and she lost one and it would be like, that would be something. She lost everything she had or half of what she had, but it's not like that either. She had ten coins. She lost one. I think what we're getting at is something different, another aspect of love, and that's obsession. As an example of that, I like to remember um, there, one of my favorite episodes of Seinfeld was when uh, George, one of the characters here, uh, well, there's a man. There was a man who it wasn't George. A man had an entire collection of of readers, not readers' digest of. TV Digest, TV Guide. It was TV Guide. And he had every, every single uh, issue of TV Guide. That's it. Ex but he lost one. It was the one where Al Roker, the weatherman, was on it. He lost it. And he was obsessed by that. And from the outside, you would say, who cares? It's a TV Guide. And second of all, it's not like it's a TV Guide with some famous person on it, some historic moment. It's just a weatherman, but he was obsessed. He couldn't stop looking for it. What it's like is um, if you've lost a tooth and your tongue goes over your mouth and it's looking for the tooth that's not there, it's that kind of obsession over what is lost. It's like um, if you've ever lost your wallet or <laughs> maybe your wife or kid has, um, objectively, it's not a big deal. What happens if you lose your wallet generally? If you're like me, you might lose 25 bucks. You might have to actually get your credit cards renewed. You might have to go to the driver's license bureau. So it'll be a hassle. Will it really be terrible? Not really. But what happens when you lose your wallet? You will look over the house and you will continue to look and you will look under the table and you will look under the bed and you will look in the car and that's what obsession is. That's what, and that's an aspect of love. It's an aspect of passion. You can't just tell somebody who's lost something to say, I'll oh, get over it. You can't because it belonged to me. It was part of what I, and it doesn't have to be a big thing. So if, think about that, if a man with a hundred sheep loses one and goes crazy finding it, if a woman with ten coin loses one and then just keeps scouring the house until she finds it and has a party, how much more? How much more with our Lord, if one of us should stray, how much more will our Lord rejoice when we're brack, brought, brack, brought back into the fold? How much more will the church rejoice when someone who's left our communion comes back because it matters and it's great? And this is the kind of good news that we have to offer. And this is the kind of teaching also we should do when our Children are younger because we want to let them know that they're always welcome back. And if, if they're lost, if somehow they follow the ways of the world, we're going to try to find them. 
because we love them, because, you know, God loves the world. He loves everybody. He loves the whole world. But He also loves every single one of us. And every single one of us matters to Him. And in baptism, He calls us by name, and He knows us by name, and He knows the number of hairs on our head. He knows us personally. We matter to Him. And that's the great news of Luke chapter 15 and the stories of the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. So thank you for spending time with us today and God bless you during this week.